A second American journalist is beheaded by ISIS militants this week as the Christian persecution and exile continues in Iraq. How should the world respond and should there be an established refuge for the Christian community of Iraq? Dr. Walid Ferez and former Florida Congressman Colonel Alan West will discuss. And millions of children and adults have read her books, acclaimed children's author of modern classics because of Win Dixie and the tale of Despero, Kate DiCamello will share the inspirations for her work and her mission to get kids reading. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An all-star show tonight. Walid Ferris, Colonel Alan West, and Kate DiCamello are straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN. Com. Let's get started. Lots to share with you. Here's the brief. News from the world over this week. There is renewed resolve from the U.S. and Great Britain following the execution of a second American journalist by the Islamic State. The jihadist group released an Internet video of the beheading of Stephen Sotloff. Sotloff's life was threatened on camera after the execution of journalist James Foley last month. In the latest video, ISIS threatens another prisoner. This time, a British national is brought forward, a terrorist insisting that the U.K. back off its, quote, evil alliance with America. Speaking from Estonia, President Barack Obama vowed to degrade and destroy ISIS. In London, Prime Minister David Cameron told Parliament on Wednesday the U.K. won't be cowed by these barbaric killers. Two days earlier, Cameron introduced new emergency legislation to fight the ISIS threat domestically and abroad. We will delve into all of this in our next segment. And the growing jihadi threat is beginning to spill beyond the borders of Iraq and Syria. On Wednesday, thousands of angry mourners buried a Lebanese soldier beheaded by the al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front terrorists from Syria. The 29-year-old sergeant was among two dozen or so Lebanese soldiers captured after militants seized a border town. The jihadi threat from the Syria-based militants is unprecedented in Lebanon. And Israel is sounding the alarm after a mix of Syrian rebel forces, including Nusra Front militants, took over a border crossing station just yards from the Golan Heights. Israeli farmers were cleared from a vineyard where mortar shells landed. Israeli officials told the AP that the rebels have their sights set on Syria for now, but they're keeping a close eye. ISIS jihadis weren't the only ones trying to send a message to America and the world. In Columbus, Indiana, three churches were vandalized, spray-painted with the word infidels, and references to a Quranic verse that reads, We will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Their refuge will be the fire, and wretched is the residence of the wrongdoers. Father Doug Marcotte, the associate pastor at St. Bartholomew's, one of the churches vandalized, said of the message, It's certainly not a warm and fuzzy verse. He questioned whether the perpetrators were sincere or just nasty pranksters. Police are investigating. And in a meeting with Pope Francis on Thursday, retired Israeli President Shimon Peres has proposed a new global peace initiative, a United Nations of Religions. Perez noted that most wars today have religious, not nationalistic undercurrents, and that the UN is ill-suited to handle today's conflicts. Perez suggests that the UN of Religions is the best way to fight terrorists who kill in the name of God. The two men last met when Francis invited the then Israeli president and Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas to pray for peace in the Vatican Gardens on June 8th. A few weeks later, war broke out in the Gaza Strip. 
In a related story, a bishop in the Holy Land is lamenting the destruction of Gaza after returning from a visit with the Christian community there. In comments made to Vatican-affiliated Fides News, Jerusalem's auxiliary bishop, William Shomali, noted that in one district, 80% of the homes and buildings have been reduced to heaps of rubble. He compared what he saw to the cities razed to the ground in World War II. During the six-week Israeli-Gaza conflict, Israel forces leveled several areas believed to be Hamas strongholds. 2,000 Palestinians were killed. Bishop Somali said there is a growing hostility toward Israel among Christians and Muslims there, and by no means a consensus regarding the actions of Hamas. And a rare victory for traditional marriage in the courts this week in the United States. Louisiana's law defining traditional marriage and its refusal to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states were upheld by U.S. District Judge Martin Feldman. Feldman's ruling Wednesday was the first to uphold a state ban since the U.S. Supreme Court struck down part of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act last year. In 2004, 78 percent of Louisiana voters approved a constitutional amendment defining traditional marriage. Meanwhile, a federal appeals judge struck down traditional marriage laws in Indiana and Wisconsin. And in New York, St. Patrick's Day Parade organizers announced that they are allowing a gay activist group to march in the parade. Out at NBC Universal, described as a lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual support group for the TV network, will march under its own banner. This is the first and a policy change for the organization. In the past, the parade organizers refused to allow gay rights groups or any other activist groups to carry signs. Since 1762, the parade has honored the Irish Catholic saint as it processes along Fifth Avenue in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral. Cardinal Timothy Dolan called the decision, quote, a wise one, noting that he and his predecessors have never determined who would or would not march in the parade. Cardinal Dolan is the Grand Marshal for the 2015 parade. On Thursday, Catholic League President Bill Donahue, a participant in the march, issued a statement. In it, he reports that parade organizers are open to including other gay groups in the parade. A spokesman for parade organizers said anyone can apply when asked if a pro-abortion group could join the parade. Donahue wrote, quote, the goal of these activists supported by the corporate elite is to neuter the religious element of the parade, end quote. And it's no secret that Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen was mistreated by the Archdiocese of New York during his lifetime. Now some are contending he's being mistreated in death. The official cause for canonization for America's first televangelist has come to an abrupt and shocking halt. The New York Archdiocese is refusing to release Sheen's body for the purposes of advancing his cause for sainthood. Sheen is buried in the crypt of St. Patrick's Cathedral. Under canon law, the body is to be inspected from where the cause originated, in this case, the Diocese of Peoria, where Archbishop Sheen was ordained a priest. Peoria Bishop Daniel Janke announced the suspension of the cause 12 years in the making on Wednesday. He noted that he had been personally assured on several occasions by New York that the transfer of the body would take place at the appropriate time. Now, according to Janke, following discussions with Rome, Sheen's cause will now be relegated to the Congregation of the Cause of Saints Historic Archive. A person close to the situation told EWTN News that Cardinal Timothy Dolan had recently written Bishop Janke, asserting that under no circumstances would the body or relics of Archbishop Sheen be moved to Peoria. That refusal effectively stalls the official Sheen cause and the anticipated first beatification of an American-born male. This is not the first time New York has turned down the Sheen cause. 
New York was offered one, if not two, previous opportunities to advance the cause before Peoria stepped forward 12 years ago. Cardinal Edward Egan, the former Archbishop of New York, refused to participate. In a statement late Thursday, the Archdiocese says Cardinal Dolan was hesitant to exhume Sheen's body, but does not object to the collection of relics that could be shared with Peoria. We'll keep you updated on this perplexing saga. A hashtag campaign is already underway online. People are tweeting hashtag free Fulton Sheen. And it appears the demise of the late Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez, has been greatly exaggerated. During a Socialist Party meeting on Monday, the government presented what it called the Delegate's Prayer. It's titled Our Chavez. Yes, it is patterned on the Our Father. It reads in part, Our Chavez, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day light to guide us and lead us not into the temptation of capitalism. Cardinal Jorge Urosa Savino of Caracas called the prayer idolatrous. He said praying it's a sin, and he urged the government to stop distributing the prayer. And finally, the raucous, acerbic, viciously funny comedian Joan Rivers is dead at 81. The comic talk show host and QVC entrepreneur died in New York following a routine procedure in her doctor's Manhattan office. She was hospitalized for several days. Joan Rivers broke down barriers for female comics and continued to ply her trade until the very end. Rivers, who made Can We Talk a trademark, spared no race or creed in her act, but perhaps the thing she will most be remembered for is her pioneering red carpet coverage and what are you wearing question that has been copied by so many. She was unafraid to poke fun at celebrities and expose their foibles. She was fearless. May Joan Rivers rest in peace. When we return, the atrocities committed by ISIS in Iraq are multiplying. What should the U.S. response be? And is it time to establish a safe haven for Christians fleeing the terrorists in Iraq? Author of The Lost Spring, Dr. Walid Fares, and former Florida Congressman Colonel Alan West, join me when The World Over Live continues. Don't miss it. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. The terrorist army Islamic State, ISIS, struck again this week, beheading a second American journalist, Stephen Sotloff, just weeks after brutally murdering photojournalist James Foley. ISIS has taken over 35,000 square miles of territory in Syria and Iraq and continues to persecute Christians and other religious and ethnic minorities in the region. To discuss the American policy and the threats facing Europe and the U.S. homeland, my first guest is an advisor to the Anti-Terrorism Caucus of the U.S. House of Representatives. He is also author of the book, The Lost Spring, U.S. Policy in the Middle East and Catastrophes to Avoid, Dr. Walid Ferris. And via satellite is a former congressman from Florida who served on the House Armed Services Committee and before that with distinction in the U.S. Army. Please welcome Colonel Alan West. Thank you for joining us. I want to start with this joint message we saw, this op-ed, David Cameron and uh, President Obama before this NATO meeting. They're saying they will not be cowed by these barbaric killers, uh, yet there seems to be no direct strategy. Your thoughts? Well, Raymond, this is an op-ed that I can uh, consider as a preamble. You know, now we're waiting for the actual text of the strategy. And, of course, the debate in Washington here is, where is that strategy? What I know is that ISIS has a strategy, and the strategy of ISIS is to make sure that they are delaying us, that they are deterring us, the beheading, it's to intimidate us, but at the same time is to prepare their cells inside the United States and also to get more jihadists around the world to come and join them. If they do this, then we'll have to pay a much higher price. Mm. They are very smart in their strategy. Mm. Uh, Colonel Allen West, I want to play something for you. This is President Obama in Estonia. Listen to this and react, please. 
Our objective is clear, and that is to degrade and destroy ISIL so that it's no longer a threat. We know that if we are joined by the international community, we can continue to shrink ISIL's uh, sphere of influence, its effectiveness, its financing, its, uh, its military capabilities, uh, to the point where uh, it is a manageable problem. And the question is going to be making sure we've got the right strategy, but also making sure that we've got the international will to do it. His statement are three different, uh, you know, pieces. You heard him say degrade, then you heard him say destroy, then you heard him say that if we are joined by the international community, we can turn into a manageable problem. Well, the point is this, which one is it, Mr. President? And even in his presentation, you did not see a very strong presentation. And those are the optics that the enemy sees. And the enemy right now, as Wally says, they have the initiative. They are on the march. They have a strategy. They have a plan. And this is not something new. We know now that the president has been receiving daily briefings on ISIS for a little over a year. And mm -hmm. we have allowed it to metastasize to this point where they have committed a horrible genocide. They have taken land that now equals Great Britain, and we still don't have any type of action. The rhetoric, uh, that's fine, but uh, now we have to see action, and that is what they understand in that part of the world, is strength and might. Colonel West, were, were the beheadings of those two Americans, one this week, one a month ago, uh, James Foley, were these acts of war, in your opinion? Well, absolutely. Uh, and, and as well, ISIS has already declared war against the United States of America. And for us to sit back and look at this as some type of law enforcement or criminal investigation saying that we're going to bring this individual or these individuals to justice, the only justice that you can do is to truly destroy this ISIS uh, entity and this, this enemy. But most importantly, you must cut off this ideology. You must understand who are his state sponsors, his financial resources sourcing stream, mm -hmm. and you also have to tackle it within our own borders, where we know that we have a problem with homegrown jihadism. Okay. Waleed Ferris, who are the supporters? Where is the financing coming from for this ISIS? It seems to be spreading like a cancer, not only in the Middle East, all over the world. Well, first you have the genesis, and then you have when ISIS was born, and it has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. In the genesis, a lot of petrodollars that came from the Arabian Peninsula, from the Gulf, to jihadists before they mutate and become ISIS. Mm -hmm. So that's why today there's criticism against Saudi Arabia, against mm -hmm. Qatar. Uh, yes, a lot of money came there, and also against some of the militias who were in Libya that have been shipped to Syria. Remember, in 2012, uh, right. many of those have been shipped, including with our help. All of this, at the end of the day, part of it at least, became ISIS. Now ISIS is on its own. It's a creature on its own. It has $2 billion. It has a lot of weapons. It is growing by the day. And it is developing its international network of cells, which is of great concern to me. Mm. The president has committed to send 350 more troops to the region. They will be in the Ara American Iraqi embassy. That means there are a thousand troops now on the ground. So much for this no boots on the ground routine. How effective is that? Is that enough firepower, if you will, to repel ISIS? And are these troops in danger since we've communicated, hey, they're here, they're sitting all here at the American embassy? Let me begin with a second point, very important. Mm -hmm. If I'm the president, I would not announce that I'm sending hundreds to the south in, in, in Baghdad mm -hmm. and few dozens to Erbil. Why? Because I'll be signaling to the other side that there are so few. If we were sending divisions and we are leading a campaign against ISIS, then, then be it. But when we signal those numbers, it will be a little bit of concern to me. Mm -hmm. Colonel West, um, your thoughts, what are you hearing from the military community, particularly those in Iraq? They seem to be, the, the messages I've been getting are, they, they have no message. They're just sitting there awaiting orders. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, I found it very interesting that now it seems that President Obama has negotiated a status of forces agreement with Iraq so that we can have troops that are there on the ground. But the most important thing that any American or any combat troop wants to know is what is their task and what is their purpose. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly agree with Waleed in that you don't tell the enemy we're sending 200 here, 300 there, and they're just sitting down at the embassy. This president continues to tell the enemy what he is not willing to do, what he does not want to do, and that's a very serious intransigent ideology. 
And so what is very frustrating for our military right now, they don't know what the guidance is. They don't know what the commander's intent is. And I can assure you that in the U.S. Central Command, they have contingency plans that are there. They just have to pull something off of the shelf. They have to adjust it, change some assumptions to the facts that they know today, and be willing to execute it. But they're not getting any direction from a White House, and especially from a president that continues to tell us what he is not willing to do and that he was elected to end wars. And that shows that he has a recalcitrance and understanding that the enemy has a vote. Mm. Uh, I, I want to throw this out to both of you, because, I, I mean, the president is suggesting, as he did at NATO, that there be some rapid response force made up of NATO uh, member countries. A good idea? It's a good idea, depending where is it going to intervene from inside Iraq. I uh, mm. wouldn't be very comfortable in having this rapid force in Baghdad. This is iranian influence place. This is very much penetrated at this point in time. I would recommend the North. We have the Kurds as our allies. I hope to see the minorities, both Christians and Yazidis, also trained and armed. So the North is a safer place if you want to conduct an intervention. Hmm. Uh, what do you make? You mentioned a moment ago they're under the sway of Iran, the Iraqi security forces. We're sending troops in to train the Iraqi security forces. That's part of the strategy so far. It is, and that has to be addressed because the Iranian influence, Iran now has Pashdar Army, Iranian Rushi Guards brigades inside Iraq. So basically, we are in the same trenches as the Iranians, while this same force is on our list of terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. Hezbollah already is inside Iraq. That's why I wouldn't recommend the southern front, but the northern front. I want to play this for you. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel talking about ISIS and the threat it presents not only in Iraq, but around the globe. Listen. We have acknowledged publicly uh, we are aware of over 100 U.S. citizens uh, who have U.S. passports who are fighting in the Middle East uh, uh, with ISIL forces. Uh, there may be more. Uh, we don't know. This crowd is as dangerous a group of people beyond just terrorists. They are an army with marrying this with an ideology and capacity to do things. They, they, they control half of Iraq today. They yeah. control half of Syria today. Uh, we better be taking them serious. Hmm. Are we taking it seriously enough? And what is the threat here to the homeland, Colonel West? Well, I don't think that we are taking it seriously enough because back in January, when ISIS crossed into Iraq and took Fallujah and Al Ramadi, there were only about 1,500 to 2,000 man strength at the time, and we did nothing. Mm -hmm. And now you have a global ideological movement that is being aligned with Abu Sayyaf out of Philippines, uh, Jamaat al Islamiyah out of Indonesia, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is pledging allegiance, uh, Ansar al Sharia out of uh, Libya, and even Boko Haram is talking about being allied to ISIS. So you have a global terrorist movement and army, a jihad this army that is uh, occurring right now. And the funny thing is that when I listen to Secretary of Defense Hagel, I also remember that this is the same Secretary of Defense from the Pentagon who is sending out pink slips to our combat leaders. So how can we say that we're going to create a rapid response force when we're degrading our military capability? Mm -hmm. And the best rapid response force that you have on the ground right now is the Kurdish Peshmerga Army, who has been starved of resources, weapons, and arms that they've been asking this administration for for quite some time. Now, the president has said he isn't going to er arm the Kurds, or we're in the process of doing that, correct? I mean, we have to state the record. Well, uh, you, I have listened to the Kurds say uh, it's not there yet. And okay. as a matter of fact, I think Wali will agree. You have the Iranians up there now trying to uh, supply weapons and support to the Kurds. So, again, we are being pushed out because of, you know, this overly cautious manner. I think that, once again, we have a president that is operating under a foreign policy and national security premise of not, not doing stupid you-know-what stuff. Mm -hmm. And that is not uh, what we should be operating under. Events are starting to dictate what the president, uh, his response is. Mm -hmm. Waleed Farris, uh, we hear reports there is at least one Boston man now who has also signed on to ISIS and may be part of this very well-orchestrated media outreach and recruitment campaign. There is a difference between what law enforcement, and they're doing a good job, mm -hmm. is, is achieving, uh, catching these people, and the reality of the pool that we have here. When I go to the chat rooms and see this discussion and chat between those based in the West, including the United States, and those based in the region, yeah. I see that the numbers are much greater. I am concerned, again, 
that what's happening in the United States is that the jihadists who are based here, who have been indoctrinated, are switching to ISIS. It's not that ISIS is recruiting more. Uh -huh. They are simply switching. They switching their allegiance. Switching their allegiance from al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. from being lone wolves. Look, there was an information about Major Hassan from jail issuing a letter to the media saying that he wants to become a citizen of ISIS, of the caliphate. What would that mean? This mm -hmm. message is not for ISIS, it's for the other jihadists inside mm -hmm. the United States. Uh, Colonel West, uh, your thoughts on are we doing enough to prevent an attack either in Europe or here. David Cameron was very clear. He raised the threat level this week, uh, expecting some sort of ISIS attack in Great Britain. No, we're not doing enough here, uh, Raymond. And you look at the fact that we have such a porous, open border uh, with Mexico right now. There are reports already that ISIS is working with the uh, narco-terrorists down in Mexico. They're establishing a base of operations in and around Ciudad Juarez, which is right across from mm -hmm. El Paso, Texas. But instead, you have a Department of Justice that's more so interested in uh, going after the uh, police in Ferguson, Missouri, accusing them of being racist, then investigating what is happening in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we have already had two Americans that were killed on the battlefield in Syria fighting for ISIS. We have a problem in this country, but political correctness, and I, I hate to say it, a political agenda and ideology, and you have an infiltration of Muslim Brotherhood types within this Obama administration are precluding us from doing what is necessary to protect our homeland. Mm. Walid Ferris, uh, speak for a moment about the strain of Islam we're seeing. Why is it so attractive now? I mean, there are so, I've spoken to scholars this week who tell me, mm -hmm. look, this is not beyond the pale of Islam, that this tracks nicely with, with the, the general Islamic teachings, the teachings of Muhammad. Well, look, the jihadists are capable going mm -hmm. up to history, back to history, Islamic history, mm -hmm. or finding verses or finding text, mm -hmm. and then merge them into a document that would become a jihadi ideology. I am now noticing that many of our officials, U.S. officials, mm -hmm. are using the term ideology. Now, five years ago, what did they say? This is not about ideology. This is about frustration. This is about new colonialism. Mm -hmm. So now they are realizing indeed that what's behind ISIS and Al Qaeda is a jihad. A ideology. selective ideology, a selectively theory. using the Quranic verses to their own ends. And you're dealing with people who are largely, according to many of the reports I've been reading, largely ignorant. Some of them yeah. can't even write their names. L let me give you an example. Uh, in the West, both of Great Britain and here, there's this theory of we're going to have fatwas, you know, religious mm -hmm. edict, and the fatwas will, will, will solve the situation. ISIS is not listening to them because this mm -hmm. is something you have to do before they are indoctrinated. Once you are indoctrinated, you have that chip in your head, mm -hmm. then you are immune. You are immune to any counter-radicalization. Colonel West, very quickly, so. before I let you go, speak to a moment about the religious fervor that is driving so much of this. This isn't just waving the flag for a given country. It is a deeply held belief, indeed a pathway to paradise for these militants, these terrorists. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is a reward in, in paradise uh, that they are being told, but also it's about the uh, Islamic supremacism. And that is what we have to be very concerned about. And we cannot dismiss this. We cannot wish it away. It is part of the ideology. It is part of their teachings. And we have to understand that this is just an ongoing chapter hmm. in some 1,400 years of, uh, you know, conflagration between the Islamic East and the uh, Western civilization. Hmm. You know, you can go back and you can study the Battle of Tours in France at 728, the Battle of Lepanto at 1571, yeah. the Battle of Vienna at 1683. These are all historic, ancient uh, instances. And there was a reason why the Pope Urban II called for, you know, protection of Christians in the Holy Land in 1095, because of exactly what we're seeing today. And, and understand that this genocide of Christians and Yazidis, it also occurred under the Ottoman Empire from 1914 to 1919. So there's nothing new under the sun. Mm, Colonel Allen West, thank you for being with us. We are going to continue this conversation. Religious minorities, particularly Christians in Iraq, are facing what is being called, what we've heard called tonight, a genocide. When we return, Walid Ferris will stay with us. He'll be joined by David Laser, a native of Iraq and a Christian. They'll update us on the current conditions in the region and their efforts to establish a safe haven for Iraqi Christians. When the World Over Live continues, stay right there.
Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. The terrorized Christian community in Iraq is facing complete extermination at the hands of ISIS. To discuss the situation on the ground in Iraq and their efforts to establish a protected safe haven for Christians in the region, I am joined once again by Dr. Walid Faris. He's an anti-terrorism advisor to the U.S. House of Representatives and via satellite from Los Angeles. is the chairman of the American Mesopotamian Organization David Lazar, a Christian and an Iraqi native. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with the Thank state you. of these refugees. David Lazar, what are you hearing for, from the Christian community in northern Iraq as well as Syria? Well, in uh, northern Iraq, first of all, they're not refugees uh, because they are still within the boundaries of Iraq. So they're mm -hmm. internally displaced mm -hmm. persons or people. Uh, uh, the status of refugee is when 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 someone leaves the country, flee to another country. Another country. Sure. Uh, they have they are now in uh, as internally displaced people inside the, the region controlled or under the control of the Kurdish regional government. The majority mm -hmm. of them are there. Of course, there are people that have gone into with relative in uh, to stay with relatives in Baghdad and in Basra and other cities throughout the country. But the majority or the bulk of them are in the uh, control and uh, the region under the control of the Kurdish regional government. Their conditions are horrible. They're staying in churches, in uh, schools. Uh, uh, ev actually, uh, some we've seen also people staying in parks and on the sidewalks. As a matter of fact, uh, school, st school year starts on um, next Tuesday uh, in northern Iraq. And the Kurdish regional government has asked few thousand families to leave uh, these schools and with no plans to house them or put them in tent or anywhere else uh, in, 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 in the area. So it's a, it's a big problem, it's a dilemma. Uh, where would these people go? Uh, and the United Nations and other non-governmental organizations are not ready uh, uh, for those, so many uh, IDPs in, mm -hmm. in, in the country. I, I want to read you something. This is from the Maronite Catholic Archbishop Paul Seah, he told Vatican Radio this week, if you don't stop ISIS now, mm -hmm. it will spread. How dangerous is ISIS, particularly to this Christian community, if it, and if it isn't stopped now? You know, Bishop Sayah has a long research and history in understanding these Christian minorities. Uh, he's one of the experts. He is right. ISIS is threatening the Christians with uh, dismantlement, with physical elimination, if they do not move away from the areas they control. Remember in Mosul mm -hmm. last June, they gave all the Christians three choices or four. Either you go to become Muslim, or you leave, or you pay a tax, or you are killed. Right. So that's the parameter under which Christians in northern Iraq, and that's why the ethnic cleansing that took place in northern Iraq hit the Yazidis, but also hundred thousands of Christians in the Nineveh Valley. Mm. It's, it's scandalous. Uh, David, uh, I wanted you to talk for a moment about your recent yes. trip to the UN. You went asking them with a series of other NGOs that a Christian haven be established, uh, a safe haven for these Christians fleeing the persecution and murderous intents of ISIS. What was the reaction like and who are these NGOs? Well, the, first of all, we went as part of the Middle East Christian Committee, which uh, mm -hmm. is comprised of uh, Maronite Christians, Belkite Christians, um, also Coptic Christians, and Chaldeans and Assyrians. Uh, these are, of course, Chaldeans and Assyrian Christians are one nation, but we're talking about denominations of mm -hmm. uh, different denominations of within, uh, you know, the body of Christ. Uh, the um, we went there and asked the international, we went met with five actually uh, missions to the United Nations. Four of them are the, from the permanent uh, members. There was France, mm -hmm. uh, United States, the UK, uh, and Russia as well. We met with the uh, Italian mission to the UN. Um, and we also met with the political division of the United Nations itself. We are asking for direct humanitarian aid to uh, NGOs that are working on the ground and without going through any uh, government agencies, such as the federal government uh, in Baghdad or the regional government in uh, Erbil. Mm -hmm. So, because there's a lot of uh, waste and there's a lot of uh, 
help is not reaching the intended uh, people. At the same time, we asked for an internationally protected area, not a safe haven. A safe haven, uh, we, we don't like the term because once there is no need for a safe haven, everything can go uh, back to uh, uh -huh. what, uh, how it used to be. Well, we don't want that. So uh, you're talking the, about a, uh, a, uh, Iraqi a military or the um, uh, uh, Kurdish militia are not able of protecting uh, our areas. So we're asking for internationally protected uh, region in the Nineveh Plain and also in the Sinjar for the Yazidis. Now in the Nineveh Plain is not only Christians. Um, we have mm -hmm. Syrian Christians and we also have uh, Yazidis and we also have Shabak. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, different people uh, from different ethnic backgrounds and different religions. The Shabaks are mainly Shiites, mm -hmm. and the Yazidis are, of course, the Yazidis, and the uh, Assyrian okay. Christians are Christians. Waleed, so, uh, uh, let, let me, just give me a second here, David. Waleed, tell area, me, uh, give me your sense of if this isn't a, a safe haven, mm -hmm. is it a protected, enduring community, an enclave that you're looking to establish? The, th the legal future of what would that be, we don't know. Or minority enclave, yeah, for all the say. Yeah, all the minorities zone. But there's a sequence that's very important. All of this discussion is theoretical, because the Christians, the Yazidis, and other minorities have been ethnic cleansed, and they are in Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. So what the delegation has demanded from the Security Council for the first time is, first of all, to bring this population back to their homes. There is a fear that ISIS will settle in their own people and family, mm -hmm. and then we're, we're, there's, there's no home to go there back. There's no to. home to go. Second, the best would be if an international force would come and just protect those areas around them. Mm -hmm. But those forces will one day have to leave. So what David is trying to say is that inside those areas, you need to empower the minorities themselves, Assyrian, mm -hmm. Chaldean, Turkmen, to arm themselves as a police force on the ground. Therefore, they will be under the international protection. Mm. David Lazar, do Christians and these minorities even want to remain in Iraq? So many have left. They're in Jordan. They're fleeing to the United States. Do they want to stay at all? Well, uh, of course, there are people that want to leave, and we don't want to stop them. Uh, you know, I can't sit here in the United States and ask people to stay. Mm -hmm. But uh, the majority of them, yes, they do want to stay. Now, our numbers before the 2003 invasion or liberation, however you want to look at it, uh, were, was about 1.4, 1.5 million. There's only about the Assyrian Christians. Now we're, we're half of that. But where, where would it stop? When would it stop? I mean, reducing or diluting our numbers is not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is ISIS, is not our numbers there. So the international community must address this problem, and by offering us a, an equal opportunity to stay in our lands, in our ancestral lands that have been mm -hmm. living there for thousands of years, I think that will be r the right thing to do now. These refugees that are waiting for visas in Jordan or in Lebanon or in other places, if they know that they can go back and uh, reestablish their lives with security, with proper security there, I, I, I assure you a lot of them will go back instead of uh, going to, uh, to Europe or Australia, Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. Waleed, um, your thoughts on the, the, this whole notion of the UN sending 11 investigators in <laughs> to chronicle and look at the crimes of ISIS, the potential war crimes of ISIS, and then the report back in March. Yeah. Is that too long? And haven't we established ISIS is this terrorist, barbarous organization? If the first report about the uh, ethnic cleansing and the war crimes will be established in March, when will the Nuremberg-like tribunal be formed to try all these atrocities? Mm. That would be in five, six years from now. No, we need speed. We need the formation of a tribunal. We need to have teams on the ground. But for that to happen, we need a strategy. We really need the President of the United States, Prime Minister of Great Britain, NATO in general, and the Arab moderates to actually create that space of freedom. Then we'll have our time to go and do the trials. Uh, patriarch Louis Sacco, the Chaldean patriarch, Catholic Chaldean patriarch in Baghdad, had this to say. 120,000 Christians are uprooted from their historical homeland because the political Islam does not want them there, and the world is silent, standing still, either because it approves or because it is incapable of acting. 
This encourages ISIS to move forward with its ferocious war against culture and diversity and threatening the intellectual and social security. David, do you agree with those comments? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. The, these, these criminals must be punished. I mean, uh, uh, Colonel West uh, earlier mentioned, uh, referred to the genocide of 1915 against the Assyrian Christians uh, uh, and Armenian Christians and also the Greeks. Uh, the perpetrators of these massacres were never punished. That's why, and of course, there were other, other massacres that happened in Iraq so in 1933, the Al-Anfal, uh, uh, 1969. So if these massacres or genocides or crimes against humanity go unpunished, then there will be more of these happening in, in the future. Uh, so these people must be put on trial. And, 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 must, and, act, and, and justice must be served. Waleed, uh, this week we had another report. A man was arrested, a Christian man, urged to convert. He refused. He was tortured, then killed and thrown into the street. How common is this? I'm going to ask both of you that question. That's what we know about, but there are reports coming from the region, from Mosul, there are testimonies. Mm -hmm. And this has to go to The Hague. This has to go to this international tribunal. These are war crimes, and these are crimes against humanity at the same time. Many Christians refused were killed in Mosul mm -hmm. and in the valley. Mm -hmm. uh, David, are you hearing the same thing from your sources on the ground? Yeah. Yes, I am. And as a matter of fact, also the Yazidis, I mean, these yeah. poor people have suffered so much. Um, um, they, they, people have been burned alive. Uh, their women have been taken and sold in market like like animals. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the, these are all crimes against humanity. Well, let's not also forget the Turkmen, the Shiite Turkmen in the, in the, in the town of Amirli. They, they fought for weeks, and, and, and so many people were, were killed and, and, and buried alive there, and it took uh, the uh, militias, the Shiite militias supported by the government, to, uh, to break the siege and finally free these people in this town. So ISIS has not discriminated. It's, it, it's gone uh, against uh, uh, Shiites, uh, uh, against uh, Christians, and also against the Yazidis. Yeah, that's what's so puzzling, Walid. I mean, you have, you have the ISIS is indiscriminately killing anyone that isn't a member of ISIS. They're even <laughs> killing fellow Muslims. Of course, of course, in Syria, in Iraq, everywhere. They call, mm -hmm. they call Shia, they call Sunni. And now it's spread to Lebanon. It has been spreading to Lebanon, to Ersal, northeastern part of Lebanon. But there is one thing about ISIL. When they find resistance, they stop. So this is a lesson. Mm -hmm. What David was mentioning was a little town of Shia Turkoman, mm -hmm. which refused to flee, which refused to self-ethnic cleanse. They fought. They lost a lot of people. They waited for help. So this is a lesson for the provinces in the north, in Nineveh and in Sinjar. These people, if they are backed, if they are trained, if they are armed, if they are under international supervision, they are their own boots on their own ground. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, tell, tell, talk to me about the threat now that we see a Lebanese officer being killed, a Muslim. Yeah, a, a Muslim Lebanese officer was beheaded mm -hmm. on video. It was posted. There is a battle in North Lebanon, mm -hmm. not just in the area where uh, ISIS attacked. We can see at least three areas where ISIS is going to come back uh, two, and this is the battlefield of Lebanon, of mm. northern Lebanon. Final question. Do you have any confidence that the international community can come to a consensus? Is a consensus even in the offing at this point? As is right now, no. If the mm. president is battling to get an alliance with Mr. Cameron, and that's the, the core, we're talking about other countries in Europe. We're talking about Arab moderate countries. We're talking about what would be the role of Syria and mm -hmm. Iran. We're talking about what Turkey would do. And we're talking about a veto at the Security Council by the Russians that we are confronting. The architecture, the architecture actually, of our foreign policy is very weak. We need to reform that. We need to catch up. ISIS is moving fast. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it there. You can find out more about the American Mesopotamian Organization and their work on behalf of the Iraqi Christian community by visiting AmericanMesopotamian.org. The Lost Spring, U.S. Policy in the Middle East and Catastrophes to Avoid by Dr. Walid Faris is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Walid, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Coming up, some much needed light. She is one of the world's most beloved children's authors, creator of because of Winn-Dixie, The Tale of Despero, and many more, Kate DeCamello joins me in an exclusive interview to discuss the importance of stories and her literacy efforts. The World Over Live returns in a moment. Stay right there.
Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Well, with schools starting and kids coming home with reading lists, the time seems ripe for this interview. She's the Library of Congress's National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. And they couldn't have found a better ambassador. Over the last 14 years, she's distinguished herself writing for children. The recipient of the Newbery Honor and two Newbery Medals, sort of the Academy Awards of Kids Lit. My next guest is the author of Because of Win Dixie, The Tale of Despero, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, and many others. Her work is moving, soulful, and filled with redemption. I spent some time talking to Kate DiCamello at the National Book Festival here in D.C. We spoke about the source of her fiction, her tips for getting kids to read, and something dear to my heart, the importance of stories. Here's my conversation with author Kate DiCamello. Madam Ambassador, I want to start with, <laughs> you, you have really been on a, on a crusade, if you will, to inspire young people to read. And through your work, you've already done that. I was telling you a little bit ago about my nine-year-old who was in tears at the end of Edward Tulane. Which made me cry, so we were off to a good start. What yeah. is it about stories that are necessary for not only children but adults? Necessary for all of us. Um, I think that particularly with kids, but also with adults, it gives you a way, it gives you a language to talk about things that you know instinctually, but you might not have the words for it. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that your daughter told you the whole story, you asked the why she was crying. Saga. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that that's the very thing right there. She's deeply moved and she can say why because she has the language of story to say mm -hmm. it in. Yeah, it, do, it really does give them a compass almost to, to take on the world and all the things that they will encounter. Well, you're, you're using, that's, I loved, I, it's a compass, it's a blueprint, it's a map. It's a way to, it's a microscope, it's a telescope. Mm -hmm. That's what story is. So, Kate DiCamello, looking at your career. And uh, it's career. A, it, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, in your, in your body of work. Um, I, I've been reading a lot of interviews, and you put persistence above talent. You believe that's more important. Why? I remember being in writing groups and having somebody much more talented to the left of me and to the right of me. and. I knew, I watched them as they proceeded. You need to be able to take rejection after rejection after rejection. And then once you get accepted, you need to be able to take criticism after criticism to make it better. And that's all persistence. And I thought, I can't make myself more talented. I can make myself do the work and I can make myself not give up. And mm -hmm. now I'm sitting here talking to you. Oh, so, please. Yeah. Madam Ambassador, this is my, <laughs> this is my honor, not yours. Uh, talk about your process for a little bit. Two pages a day. That's all you do. Right, Why not do you much. Why restrict yourself to just that? Um, I, when I began, because I spent, it was a long time before I began, I, oh, yeah. I, for almost 10 years, I was in college, a professor said, direct quote, you have a certain facility with words, you should consider graduate school. Hmm. And at 20, I thought that he was trying to tell me that I was wildly talented huh. and that I was going to be a rich and famous writer. So I thought, why bother with graduate school, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're Why bother right. with the graduate school? And so I, I spent the next decade talking about being a writer, wanting to be a writer, telling people that I was a writer, wearing black turtlenecks, looking disengaged and 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 like disdainful. So you were halfway there. <laughs> right. The only thing I wasn't doing was writing. Well, you know. Darn it. Yeah. So and when I started, I thought. Uh, I, at the time that I started, I was running. I could make myself run two miles a day, and I thought, here's this thing that I say matters to me more than anything else. So I'll just say, I'm gonna do two pages a day. Two huh. miles a day, two pages a day. That's and you do it every day, no more than that? Uh, Even it, on when days? I'm in the, <laughs> no, you, you know that Hemingway thing about you wanna be nice to the you that exists the next day. So if it's oh. a hot day, you stop yeah. so that it'll be easier to pick it up the mm -hmm. next morning, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I've been there. <laughs> I haven't observed that rule. I come cold that next day, you know. <laughs> but boy, I, I got three pages the, next, the, the, the day before. Tell me about the origin stories, if you will, about that. My children and I have been talking about these, these stories. They cross genres. These characters are very dissimilar from Despero to Edward Tulane. Start with Winn-Dixie, your breakthrough book. Um, such a beautiful, in some ways, painful book. 
Um, it is. Tell yeah, me about a, that book, where it came from. Um, I grew up in Florida, mm -hmm. and um, right before I started to write, I moved to Minnesota. And I wrote Win Dixie um, the second winter there, which was one of the, the worst, worst winters on record. Last year was was yeah. a contender, well, yeah. I have to <laughs> <Part> say. Two. <laughs> right, part two. Um, and so I was homesick for Florida. I couldn't go home. I didn't have enough money to go home. And also, it was the first time in my life I'd been without a dog. Um, and so I made a dog up. And all of this is looking back in retrospect. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I was just feeling my way through the story. But that is, that's the origin. And I can look back and say that. Uh, there's a lot of um, abandonment disappointment in these stories. Despero's mother's disappointed with him. Um, at one point, uh, uh, Abilene's grandmother is disappointed in Edward. It seems to be a theme, huh? What is yeah. that? Where does that come from? It does linger uh, over the world. That's the only common denominator I see here. That and friendship. Yeah. And there's and always, yes. Wow, you have done your homework. No, my kids have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just <laughs> listen to them and read along. Yeah. Those things keep on showing up. Why the disappointment? I don't know. I, I exist perpetually uh, in fear that I will disappoint. Um, I don't know where it comes from, but it certainly ends up in those stories. I have been saved by wonderful friendships in my life, and I have found forgiveness and redemption and stories in those friendships. So. Where, where did Edward Tulane come from? Someone gave you a little yes, China bunny? Yes, I was gonna say, again, you've done your research. Yeah, a, a big China, oh, wow. a big actually melamine, which doesn't Ooh. have quite the resonance as a word that, yeah, China, that China does. does yeah. yeah, so it's a rabbit made out of melamine, dressed very elegantly, and um, kind of a creepy rabbit. Well, tell me about that book. There's been a lot written about it. There has and been. And when you read it, he spends 40 days and 40 nights in the garbage dump. Um, he, uh, he, he has essentially a last supper before he's cast out. Right. Uh, uh, tell me about the um, biblical overtones there. Um, I, all unwitting, I, it's, it's like I can look back and see all of that. None of that is conscious on my part. When people point it out to me, this is the beauty of critics and teachers <laughs> and librarians. Yeah. It's like people will tell you mm -hmm. what is in your book, but it's not always something that I can see until it's mm -hmm. done and the book is out in the world. So mm -hmm. I'm working on an instinctual kind of basis and plugging into something larger and better than I am. Animals are very frequent in these works. Kelly. Yeah. They, they are everywhere. What do animals represent to you? We were talking about Dean Koontz a little while ago. Yeah. Dean uh, has, has, uh, has always had these Labrador retrievers. He believes they're almost like guardian angels. Yeah, I would, yes. And, and, and almost every book that I've done has an animal in it. And it's gotten to the point where I think I should not put an animal in there, but it, they keep on showing up. And it's, I think for me, they provide a, as a writer, a level of safety and comfort. It's mm. what I loved as a child. And I think mm. as readers, we're much more inclined to open our heart to an animal protagonist. We trust more quickly there. Yeah, no, and you, and I know recently, uh, you, you've, you've returned, if you will, to your Mercy Watson roots. Mercy Watson is this lovable pig. Yes. Uh, that, that was part of a, a picture book series. Now you're, you've really done a spinoff. Yeah. Tell me about this. <laughs> right, and I didn't, you know, I... And it's I not an animal. It, it, well, there is an animal in it, though. You know, see, because I can't <laughs> help myself. It just keeps on happening. There's a horse in it named yeah. Maybelline. Um, so there are all these secondary characters in those Mercy Watson books, and I thought, I missed Mercy, and I, and I thought, I want to do more, and how can I do more in a different way? So I thought, I'll take these secondary characters and tell their stories. So this is Leroy Ninker, a reformed thief. <laughs> He stole a toaster from the Watson household. I want to be cowboy. Right, and he also wants to be a cowboy, and he gets a horse that he hopes when he goes to purchase this horse that the horse's name is going to be Tornado instead. It is Maybelline. Maybelline. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and, and mayhem ensues. Tell me, when you start a new project, are you still trepidatious? Are you still fearful? Oh, I am fear incarnate right here. This is me. Yeah, I'm always terrified. And I don't... I've learned to not wish that away. It, um, 
it's part of the whole thing for me. It's the, I don't ever know what's going to happen in a story. It's the no wonderful. Outlining. No, it's that Elmer Leonard quote. If I knew what was going to happen, I wouldn't write the story. I write to find out, wow. and that has a certain element of fear in it, but also self-discovery. So wow. it's just the way it is. That's right? so scary to me. I just finished my first children's book, and it, it took me years. But I had to outline this thing. I couldn't imagine. But everybody works blind. differently. I mean, I have so many friends who write, and there are some people that would never think about doing a novel without outlining first. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I've tried, and as soon as I outline it, I don't want to write it. It's dead to you. Yeah, exactly. It's so something. there's no right way. I and congratulations on your book. Well, uh, you're, well, read it first. You may not be so <laughs> congratulatory, but I'll send you a copy. Uh, E.B. White had that great line that writing is an act of faith, not an act of grammar. Uh, do you I didn't know that, that line. I love that. And I love E.B. White, yeah, so thank you. One of the most beautiful writers. Say it again. Uh, Say it. He, and, uh, writing is an act of faith, not an act of grammar. Right. But you need to use the grammar to get to the faith. Right. <laughs> does, your, does your personal faith ever work its way into the works? All of me works its way in there. Uh, the mm -hmm. whole of me is revealed on the page. Anybody who is mm -hmm. writing necessarily reveals himself even when they think that they're hiding. So every part of me mm -hmm. is on there. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I'm going to start this new literacy campaign. It's called Rays of Wonder, which kind of aligns nicely with your work. What would be your advice to parents and to the kids themselves about encouraging this lifelong love of reading and reading nourishing works, not just comic books? I've interviewed others who said, oh, if they're reading comic book, that's fine. Let them read anything. Do you agree with that? I say let them start wherever they want to start mm -hmm. and they'll find their way. Mm -hmm. But as far as, and now I get to put on the ambassadorial, Not is that an, an idea, hat and say reading together, um, letting your children see you reading a book for your own pleasure. Not making it a task, making it uh, a privilege yeah. and a joy and a celebration and also just a way to engage with each other. Have your child read to you, you read to your child. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so many people, you know, 15 minutes you have to read. Don't, don't yeah. do that. Yeah, why? You, you, you get to read. You oh. get to read. It is an absolute privilege and there is nowhere in this country that you can't go and get a book. We have libraries mm. everywhere. It's available to everybody and it's a privilege. Mm. Kate DiCamillo, this has been a privilege for me and for us. Thank you. Thank, and thank you. you for your work. Beautiful. Thank you. When pressed, these are the books Kate DiCamillo recommends for kids. Wonder, to Kill a Mockingbird, Charlotte's Web, one of my favorites, and I would add her own Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. You'll be weeping tears of joy by the end. Kate's latest picture book, Leroy Ninker, Saddles Up, is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Well, that's all the time we have until next week. Next week's show is a winner, so make sure you're here. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And be sure to join us for EWTN Live with Father Mitch Pacwa next Wednesday. I have an announcement to share with you. And tune in here for my exclusive interviews with the Anglican Vicar of Baghdad, Canon Andrew White, and others. I'll also be talking with Harry Connick Jr., Morgan Freeman, and the stars of the new family film, Dolphin Tale 2. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. See you next time. Bye now. Thank you.